Hallelujah. Way low. Tell you don't give up. Hallelujah. Don't throw in the towel. Oh, don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up on you. He said. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Williams, and as always, I greet you with Jesus' joy. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God stands forever, and it is our joy again to bring you uh, the word of God. And hope and pray that this blesses your spirit. So sit back, relax, enjoy this word, and I'll see you after the worship experience. Man, it is good to see you in the house of the Lord. Anybody glad to be here for Midday Manor today? I can't think of a better place to be than to be right here at this time with these people doing this thing. We praise God. We honor him for just another day's journey. Amen. And we're thankful to be in the house of the Lord. Nothing but his grace and his mercy. Anybody know he is indeed awesome? He's awesome. Amen. Just think about how good he's been. Awesome is a good word. Amen. We know we have some people who are on their way here for worship from work. And uh, we're going to pray their safe passage here as they get here. And we know that others perhaps only have 30 minutes for lunch. So they have their bologna sandwich right now in front of their computers watching us by live streaming. And we welcome them uh, as we worship with them. Amen. During this time of worship. And we're grateful to God to be able to offer this opportunity for people uh, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, uh, to come on hump day and get a little extra something to make it through the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Amen. So it is so good to see you here today. Y'all ready for the word today? Amen. Do me a favor, join hands with those around you now as we prepare with prayer for the word of God after we will have prayed. Please remain on your feet for the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, indeed, you are awesome. There is none like you in all of the universe. You're in a class by yourself. God, we praise and honor and worship you for who you are. And we thank you for what you've done in our lives. If it hadn't been for your grace, we don't know <laughs> where we would be. Thank you for your mercy, for your grace and your love. Now, God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins because even with the best of intentions, we've missed the mark sometimes by a mile. But we read in your word that if we would confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, God, as we receive that promise, the cleansing of your blood and uh, forgiveness of our sins, we now consecrate ourselves and set ourselves now aside to receive the seed of your word. And we pray, God, that as the seed is sown in this place, that it will go forth and find good ground on the soil of our soul. And with time and tending, we'll bring forth the fruit of the character and conduct of Christ. Because more than anything else, Lord, we want to be like Jesus in our hearts. Now, God, I pray for me. God, you call me and you know all about me. Let no flaws, faults, or failures in me hinder the free-flowing movement of your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, don't penalize your people for anything in me that's not like you. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked way in me, cast it out. Lead me in the way that is eternal. Take my mind, Lord, and think with my mind, my mouth, Lord, and speak with my mouth and maybe my voice, but let it be your words, I pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer and god we will be careful to give your name praise honor and glory for you and you alone are worthy of the highest praise honor and glory in jesus mighty and magnanimous name we ask it for his sake we do pray all who agree with that prayer say amen come on put your hands together for our awesome god amen uh, ushers, go ahead and let those in the vestibule come in quickly, quiet, and reverently. If you would, turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. I want to lift up for our consideration verses 9 through 14. Come right on in, worshipers. Come right on in. Find your spot you like. 
and we're just going to wrestle a little bit with a very simple subject matter. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, if you found it, say amen. In the New International Version of the Greek text, if you were to turn there, beginning with verse 9 in chapter 18, you'll find these words. It reads, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a sinner. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. <laughs> Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even <laughs> like this dude standing next to me, like this, <laughs> like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast, his chest, and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. You may be seated. With the help of the Holy Spirit in your prayers, I want to talk to you from the simple theme, two men went to pray. Amen. Two men went to pray. Do me a favor. Help me preach this. Look at your neighbor and tell him, two men went to pray. Mm-hmm. That's all I want to talk about. Come on in. We got more worshipers. They still coming in. They were in a hurry. They were driving on two wheels to get in here. Amen. Two men went to pray. Those who know about Jewish people in Jesus' time and even now know that those who are of Jewish faith have worship and the worship of God at the center of their faith. Because worship is at the center of their faith and they value worship, the worship of God, then because of worship, they are people of song. One thing that is true about Jewish people is that they are singing people. One of the evidences of the, the fact that they value songs is that a large portion of the Old Testament is in a real sense, a Hebrew hymn book of 150 psalms, which are simply 150 songs. And they have songs that have come out of, address every imaginable experience they have been through. But not only are they, because worship is at the center of their faith, the worship of God, people of song, but they are also people of prayer. It is difficult to talk about worship and being a worshipful people without realizing that they are people of prayer. And just as they have had songs come out of or songs address every imaginable experience that they have had or will have, it is also similarly true about their prayer life and the prayers that they pray. They have a prayer for just about every imaginable occasion because they are people of prayer. In fact, the fact that we are talking about prayer reminds me that this is a very special time of prayer on the Christian calendar. This is the season of Lent. And those of you who observe it or know about Lent knows that it is a 40-day period uh, from Ash Wednesday, which I believe was last Wednesday, all the way to Easter. It is a 40-day period because it commemorates or parallels or highlights Jesus' 40 days of prayer and fasting in the wilderness in preparation for his ministry. 
He wrestled there uh, with the enemy, with the devil who sought to tempt him to undermine and mess up his mission. And so he fasted and he prayed. And during the 40 days of Lent, it is a time when people pray. Prayer is central to these 40 days and many people fast. Some give themselves over to the service of others. And in this 40 day period of Lent, you don't count the Sundays as times and days of fasting because Lent anticipates Easter, which is a Sunday, and each of the 40, each of the six Sundays within the 46 days are considered kind of many Easter's. And so their presence in the 40 day cycle reminds us that this 40 days of prayer during Lent and fasting is a, not only a time of repentance, but it is also a time of repentance mixed with anticipatory joy, which means that during the 46 days, the 40 days we observe, the six Sundays are days that remind us that we're on our way to the day that death died. It was a day when the conquering hero of Calvary took the sting out of death, robbed the victory from the grave, snatched the crown from Satan's head, and declared all power in heaven and earth is in his hand. And so this 40-day period, this time of Lent, is a time when prayer is the emphasis. And since prayer is the emphasis and prayer is on everybody's mind, then perhaps you are receptive and susceptible to teaching about prayer. And in our text today, we have a parable on prayer. The Prince of Parables, Jesus tells a parable about prayer. He tells a parable about prayer because Jesus wants us to know how to pray and pray right. Jesus was a part of a praying people and Jesus was a praying man. In fact, the most devout of Jewish prayers prayed three times a day, the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour, or 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. And when they prayed, they believed that your prayer was more edifying or had more efficacy if you prayed in the temple. But if you couldn't get to the temple, at least pray in Jerusalem facing the temple, or if you couldn't be in Jerusalem, at least be in Palestine, facing Jerusalem, facing the temple. If you couldn't be in Palestine, wherever you are, just face the east, face Palestine so you could face Jerusalem, so you could face the temple. And incidentally, that is why when Daniel was in Babylon, he still prayed three times a day, but remember, he would climb the stairs, open the window to the east, facing the holy land, which was the land that contained the holy city, which contained the holy place, which was the temple. And he would pray, hoping as he prayed and offered that audible prayer in the atmosphere that the wind would catch the echo of his prayer and take it from the lowlands of Babylon up to the holy hills of Jerusalem. And so if you prayed in the temple, it was particularly beneficial to pray. And so Jesus here is telling a parable about prayer. And what is interesting about the prayer or the parable is not just the content, but the context. Because it is arguably true that this particular parable in Luke 18, 9 through 14 is paired with another parable in the same chapter. Because this parable, remember, is verses 9 through 14. There is another parable on prayer in verses 1 through 8, and they are paired together. And the reason why they're paired together is because though Jesus is making a point about prayer, both of these parables are directed to two different audiences with two different lessons. The first parable in verses 1 through 8 uh, is directed to Jesus' disciples. In fact, it says that in verse 1, that this is a parable that Jesus tells his disciples. And Jesus tells the parable to his disciples in the first eight verses in order to stimulate their faith 
and their desire to be persistent in prayer. You remember, many of you Bible students remember the content of the parable. Jesus tells a parable about a widow and a judge. She goes to the judge to get justice, but the judge cares nothing about people or God. The only thing he responds to is monetary bribes, but she doesn't have the cash to bribe him. She has no advocate to pay on her behalf. She has nothing going for her except persistence. And so the Bible says that she every day, all day, is in the courtroom saying, give me justice. He ignores her completely, takes the bribes and judges accordingly, but she is so persistent that the Bible says that she wears him down with her persistence. And after a while, he says, look, I got to do something for this woman before she drives me in this courtroom crazy. Woman, what do you want? And because she was persistent, a judge who cared nothing about people or God, but only responded to bribes, made her an exception because she was so persistent. And Jesus says that we ought to be persistent in prayer as well. But wait, when Jesus teaches it, it is not comparison, it is contrast. Jesus is telling us to be persistent, not because God is like that judge. The judge did not want to respond, but was forced to respond. But God is not like that judge. In other words, God is not a God who is grudging about responding to prayer requests. God is the opposite of the judge. God leans his head over the balcony of eternity and points his ear anxious to hear from the mouth of all of his children and waiting with tiptoe anticipation to respond because he's a prayer hearing, prayer answering God. And what he's suggesting is that if a judge who cares nothing about people or God will respond based solely on persistence, how much more will a heavenly Father who's anxious to respond to your prayers, re respond to your persistent prayers. Now when he says be persistent he does not mean that you will get because of your persistence whatever you ask. What he's saying is because of your persistence, you in the face of your persistence, God will always answer your prayers. It may be no, it may be yes, it may be wait but you're going to get an answer. And you don't persist because God does not want to answer your prayer. It is it precisely because God wants to answer your prayer that you ought to be prayerful in your life. That you ought to always pray to God knowing that God will answer your prayers. Can I get a witness? Now... He tells that prayer so that his disciples would be anxious to pray, that they would not only be involved in the action of prayer, but will have an attitude of prayer, a heart that is always tilted towards heaven, always in constant conversation with God because God loves communion with his children. After he tells that particular parable to strengthen and stir up and stimulate the faith of his disciples, he changes audiences and tells this parable about prayer in verses 9 through 14, not to his disciples, but to those who are self-righteous, those who believe that they are righteous within themselves, that their righteousness is not based on mercy, but merit. He says, and his target audience, the implication is the Pharisees. Now, before we even get to the meat of the matter, I think it's worth mentioning how wonderful Jesus is because Jesus is not only reaching out to those who are receptive, but when Jesus points this parable to self-righteous people, people who ends up and often are his adversaries in his ministry, it lets you know that Jesus is not only concerned about sinners who know they're sinners, but he's concerned about reaching people who don't think they need to be reached. 
you're not hearing what I'm saying. The heart of God is that none should perish. And what is interesting is the approach that Jesus uses to people who are sinners and know they are and people who are sinners and don't know they are. Uh, because one is soft-hearted and the other is hard-hearted. And Jesus' approach is often that he's soft on sinners, but he's hard on hypocrites. And the reason why he's hard on hypocrites is not because he hates hypocrites, but he has to be hard on hypocrites because hypocrites, or people who don't know they need help, are people whose hearts are hard. And if you want to get through to hard-hearted people, you can't use a feather, you got to use a hammer. <laughs> And oftentimes, Jesus has to reach them, not by embracing them, but by shocking them into their spiritual senses. And so sometimes his approach is not an arm on the shoulder, but Jesus verbally grabs them by the lapels of their spirit and shakes them until he tries to shake them to their spiritual senses. And so that's what Jesus is lovingly doing in this parable because love doesn't always feel like love. Preach, Pastor Williams. And so Jesus lovingly reaches out to people who don't think anything's wrong with them in this parable about prayer. And here's the parable. Jesus says two men go to pray. <laughs> and he says one of them stands before God in the temple, the best place to be, and begins to pray. Now, it is interesting when the man begins to pray, if you don't already know the content of the prayer, you would think that he's starting out real well. Because when he starts the prayer, he says, Lord, I thank you. Now, listen, y'all, if there's a good way to start a prayer, that's the best way to do it. He says, Lord, I thank you. There's something commendable about beginning your prayer with thank you. Because usually we come to God with a long list and litany and our beginnings of our prayer is, Lord, give me. Now, I'm not suggesting that God is not the one who has what you need. But sometimes your attitude could be altered even while you're praying if you would start with, Lord, thank you, before you say, Lord, give me. If you start with, Lord, thank you, it helps stir up and stimulate an attitude of gratitude. In fact, before you ask God for anything, you ought to thank God for everything. Can I get a witness in here? In fact, one of the things that captures my attention about Jairus, you remember Jairus who comes to Jesus on behalf of his sick daughter who's uh, somewhere between life and death, time and eternity, this world and the world to come. The Bible says when he comes to him, he comes to him because it's an emergency situation. He wants Jesus to go home, lay hands on his daughter before it's too late and heal her. The first thing he does is the Bible does not say he asks Jesus for anything. The first thing he does is he falls at his feet and he worships him. He doesn't ask Jesus for anything. He falls first and worships him. Does anybody, is this not all? He falls at it. He doesn't ask him for anything. He just worships him for who he is, for what he's already done. And you know, my brothers and sisters, I've got a sneaking suspicion that if we would just stop at the beginning of our prayer and start thanking God, for what he's done and don't do it in general if you mess around and count your blessings and name them one by one i bet you what's going to happen is that list you got probably will get smaller and smaller because you'll be so busy being grateful for what god has already given you that you'll forget about what you think you thought you needed can i get a witness in here Sometimes you don't need anything else until you can appreciate what you already have. In fact, we wouldn't be so jealous of what other people had if we would just stop and thank God for all the things that we already have. Come on, you may not have a car, but if you got a bus ticket and can get from point A to point B, you ought to thank God for that. And even if you ain't got a bus, if you got to walk, you mean you got feet? If you've got feet, you got something to thank God for. You may not be able to eat steak Diane, but if you can eat a fried bologna sandwich every now and then, you ought to thank God for that. You don't have brand name clothes. If you got clothes, 
Come on. Your house may not be split level, but if you ain't got to live under a bridge, you ought to thank God for what he... I'll give you 10 seconds to go ahead and thank God for what he's already done for you. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's been good. Yes, he has. So the next time you go to God feeling sorry for yourself because your life isn't the way you want it to be, start first by just remembering all the things you can thank him for. And I bet you you'll have an attitude alteration. He said, Lord, I thank you. And that's the best way to start a prayer is, Lord, I thank you. Only problem is that as you examine the content of the prayer, it isn't long before it takes a turn for the worst. <laughs> he said, Lord, I thank you that I am not like <laughs> other people. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other people. He said, I'm not a liar. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. Lord, I, in fact, Lord, <laughs> uh, let me tell you what I do, Lord. Lord, I, <laughs> Lord, I fast twice a day and twice a week, and I, I give a tithe of all that I have. Uh, now, I want you to know something about this prayer. First of all, I want you to notice that he suffers from a serious eye disease. <laughs> eye this and eye that and I the other. And then you notice that his problem in the prayer is pride. And one of the problems with praying with pride is that pride can't really pray. Yeah, pride keeps the prayer from getting to its destination. You can't connect with the creator if you're praying with pride because pride is a barrier to the communication. Here's a man, you notice that he has, he has, it's a kind of uh, congratulatory conversation he's having with God. Self-congratulatory. He's talking about how wonderful he is. It really isn't a prayer, it's more a testimonial to himself. He's kind of standing there in the temple giving God a kind of guided tour to the trophy room of all of his personal achievements. It's almost as if he thinks God is impressed by what he's telling God he has done. It, it's really a kind of narcissistic preoccupation with himself. And then it gets even worse because it moves from self-congratulatory prayer to a kind of uh, self-analysized superiority. Yeah, he's analyzed, analyzed himself and he says, I'm superior to other people. So he's talking to God about how great he is. And that ain't prayer. Lord, look at what I do. And, and he goes beyond the expectation because he says, Lord, uh, I uh, fast twice a week. And the only time the nation is obligated to fast is once a year on the Day of Atonement. But he says, I fast twice a week even though it's only required once a year look at me God look at what I'm doing look how righteous I am twice a week and uh, it was probably Monday and Thursday given who's praying because Monday and Thursday were market days those were the days when most people <laughs> went to the market uh, and if you are a person full of pride and personal piety, like the guy praying in this prayer, then you do want to fast on Monday and Thursday because people like him, when they fasted, wanted people to know they were fasting. And so they would not wash their face. They would, their hair would be disheveled. Their clothes would be disheveled as well. And on their way to the temple. Now, they're trying to get there. But it just so happens that at the moment of prayer, when the time of prayer comes, they can't get there in time and they end up stuck in the marketplace on Monday and Thursday. Y'all missing it.
Marketplace, when most people are in the marketplace, which means that he can parade his piety and expose it to the greatest number of people. He has the biggest audience on Monday and Thursday, so he tries to get to the temple, but he can't get there in time. He's miscalculated his time. So when the time of prayer comes, hair disheveled, face un washed clothes out of order he stops in the middle of the crowd and begins to pray so everybody can see just how holy he is I'm not making it up it's in the text y'all looking at me like I'm that's the dude in the text I, 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 I fast twice a day or twice a week and I I, uh, I tithe off of everything. And the Lord didn't require that he do tithes off of everything, but he went the extra mile. Look at what I've done, God. And I, I thank you that I'm the kind of person that I am. Thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Especially, I want to thank you for not being like this guy praying right next to me. He's a tax collector, and everybody knew tax collectors were sinners. And so, Lord, thank you that I'm not like him. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever entertained that attitude? Lord, I, I may be bad, but at least I'm not like. <laughs> I'm not like them. Now, you might even preface it by saying, I'm a sinner, I might be a sinner, but at least I'm not like them. As soon as you add, at least I'm not like them, then you have just adopted an attitude of superiority. Lord, at least I'm not like, I'm not everything I ought to be, but I'm glad I ain't as bad as, as they are. Now, the problem in his prayer, aside from pride, is comparison. The reason why he saw himself the way he did is because he was comparing himself to other people. And in case you hadn't figured it out yet, if you want to feel superior, all you have to do is find somebody who's not doing as well as you. It's not hard to find somebody who's falling in areas where you're excelling. And I said that on purpose. That's falling in areas <laughs> where you're excelling because they may be falling in areas where you're excelling, but there are areas in your life where you're not excelling. And what happens is it gives us a false sense of righteousness when we compare ourselves to the unrighteous behavior of other people around him. His problem was that he was comparing himself to the wrong person. If you really want a wake-up call, don't compare yourself to the people sitting around you. If you really want to know what your real status is when it comes to righteousness, compare yourself to Jesus. Compare yourself to the holiness of God. That'll give you a good wake-up call. Preach, Holy Ghost. There, there was a man, the man says that he was in a train. He was in, he was in England. He was in a train. Long ago, he was in a train, traveling in a train during the wintertime. And while he was traveling, he was looking out the window, and he passed by this house on the hill, beautiful whitewashed cottage. And it was beautiful. He said it was so white, it, it seemed to shimmer in the light with the, with the noonday sun. It was as white as it could he could imagine white to be. It's a beautiful uh, cottage, and he, he passed by and kept it in his mind. On the way back, it was snowing. And when he saw it this time, he looked at the hill, same house, but it didn't look as white. It didn't look as white because it was surrounded on the ground with fresh, undisturbed snow. And the snow was so white that when he compared the whiteness of the snow to the whiteness of the building, the building no longer looked white, it looked gray. Because he was comparing it to something that was superior to it. And what I'm suggesting is that when we compare ourselves to the one who was tempted in all points yet without sin, if we compare our holiness to the holiness of God, that will really give us a more accurate assessment of where we really are. Y'all think I don't have no witnesses. Come here, Isaiah. Isaiah will tell you. He says this, watch. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. High, lifted up, train field the temple, smoke everywhere, seraphim, cherubim. He said, after I saw the Lord, here's his first response. Woe is me, for I am undone. You missed the comparison. He said, I thought I was doing all right 
until I caught a glimpse of God. And when I saw God, I said, woe is me. And if you really want to get a taste of woe is me, then stop comparing yourself to other people and compare yourself to God. And it will make you see yourself the way we really accurately ought to see ourselves. It's a real cure for self-righteousness and superiority, spiritual superiority. The truth of the matter is once we catch a glimpse of God's holiness, then it just reminds us that we all have one thing in common. All have sinned. Come on, talk to me. And come short of the glory of God. Can I get a witness? And I know these days in our post, whatever it is, it's not popular to talk about sin, but sin is sin. Come on, talk to me. And we may compare our lives with others, but the truth of the matter is all of us miss the mark by a mile in some area of our lives. Can I get a witness in here? His problem was that he was so full of his own accomplishments that he had impressed himself with what he had accomplished. The problem with him also was that he focused on external displays of righteousness. Jesus, however, taught about the internal attitude of a person and not simply the external actions of a person. He was talking to the Pharisees one time, and watch what he called them. He called them whitewashed tombs. No, he didn't. <laughs> what he's saying is, he says, you guys remind me of a cemetery where there is a tomb that is beautiful on the outside. But if you open it up, he says, inside there's dead men's bones. And he says to his own disciples, he says, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. He said, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees because it will mess up your whole life because they are not concerned about the condition of the inner person. They're only concerned about parading external acts of piety to give people the impression that there's something that they're not. And Jesus had to check him one time. He said, y'all run around here condemning people because they commit adultery. He said, but I say unto you that if you have lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery. Y'all don't like this. He said, y'all think you're superior to other people because you have not taken a knife and stabbed someone to death and murdered them. He says, but I say unto you that if you have hatred in your heart, for brother, if you're angry already, he said you already have killed them in your heart. Pre ain't nobody saying nothing in here. What he's saying is you guys are dealing with the fruit of the matter. I'm trying to get to the root of the matter. He said, uh, the reason why somebody stabs them is because they're angry. The reason why there's adultery is because there's lust. He says, if I can get to the anger, the hatred, and the lust, then you don't ever have to worry about what's going to happen afterwards. So I did not come to change your behavior. I came to change your heart. I didn't come to give you a behavior transplant. I came to give you a heart transplant. And if I give you a new heart, you're going to live a new life. Preach, Pastor. And so Jesus says this same issue of internal life is the same attitude you have to bring to your prayer life. Don't impress people with what you pray and how you think you live. He says when you come to pray, especially if you're praying now during Lent season, he says make sure that you have the right attitude when you pray. If you want to hook up with the Holy, if you want to connect with the Creator, if you want to really engage God, if you really want to have authentic communion with God, then you can't bring pride to the prayer with you because prayer Pride is going to get in the way of your prayer. Talk to me, somebody. In fact, the problem with the man was is that he thought he was righteous based on his behavior. That is, that he was so impressed with his behavior that he thought God would be impressed too. Imagine that. Thinking <laughs> you can impress the one who doesn't simply see the outward appearance, but also sees the heart. Ooh, it's mighty quiet up in this piece today. 
You get impressed. In fact, what's so exciting about our relationship with God is that it's not based on merit. Okay, let me go to the other prayer because y'all look confused. Uh, Jesus says, this man finished his self-congratulatory prayer, breaking his arm to pat himself on the back for the good life he has lived. And nearby is the guy he was talking about. And if you consider the content of his prayer, the Bible says when he comes, he doesn't even look up. He doesn't even look up to God. Now, I think it's important for me to put a comma here and point something out because I don't want you to get the wrong impression by the fact that his head is down and he's not looking to God and he's aware of his sinful condition. I want you to notice that even though he is aware that he is a sinner, it didn't stop him from coming to church or praying to God. I need to say that because I need you to understand that one of the things that the enemy is going to do is when you mess up in life, especially if you mess up real bad or if you mess up again in the same thing you've been working with, on the, the enemy is going to say, ain't no use in you praying. God ain't going to hear you. Uh, why are you praying again? Why would God listen to somebody who wasn't serious the first time? All them promises you make and you keep on breaking these promises, God ain't got time for you. And if you're not careful, the fact that you have missed the mark again, that you have disappointed yourself and therefore believe that you've disappointed God will keep you from connecting to God. I just had a conversation with someone who says that they had someone who wanted to come to church, who wanted to pray, but they didn't think that God would listen to their prayers. They didn't think they were worthy to come into the house of prayer. They didn't think God wanted to hear anything. I said, let me talk to them. Tell, tell them God ain't like that. God God is not a God who holds grudges. Tell them God ain't like I tell them he's got God mixed up with people. People are like that. But tell them God is not like that. Not my God. So you may feel like you've let God down, but I don't care how bad your behavior makes you feel. Whatever you got to do, just go to God in prayer anyway. And what you're going to find out is God is not standing there with his cosmic hands on his hip and his finger of condemnation. God is sitting on his throne with his arms wide open and he's inviting you to come sit up in his lap and tell him all about it. Watch the text. I'm almost finished. I'm running out of time. But the text says he could not even look at God. And all he did was say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, I don't have nothing to bring to impress you. Nothing that I could give you that would convince you that I deserve to be in your presence. I have not earned anything. I do not own anything that impresses you. I come simply admitting that I've missed the mark. And I come throwing myself at the mercy of your feet. I heard that you're a God of grace and you're a God of mercy. And I'm counting on the fact that you're going to look beyond my faults and see my need. So all I got to say is not how much I go to church, not how much I tithe, not how many people I help. The only thing I got to say today, Lord, is in spite of all of the good things I've done, I know that there are times when I've missed the mark. So I stop by on my way home to just tell you, Lord, I'm a sinner, but have mercy on me. And the Bible says when they left, one of them left the same way he came. The one with pride did not get a connection and he left with the same personal piety he had when he came in. But the one who was broken by his own sins, the one who was lacerated by his own mistakes, the one who was ashamed of the things that he had not gotten right. The Bible says when he asked for mercy quicker than right now, faster than immediately, God responded. Because if there's one thing God loves to give is he loves to shower down mercy. Somebody say mercy. Is there anybody in here who knows about mercy? In fact, the Bible says that God gives new mercy every morning. Not only does he give new mercy every morning, but the psalm says his mercy endureth forever. And if you need a reason to shout, can I give you a reason to shout? Here's your reason to shout. You ought to shout because mercy does not have an expiration date. I'm so glad that God never runs out of mercy. 
Now your friends may not, may not give you mercy. Your friends may run out of grace. Your friends may not have anything to do with you. Not anymore. Because you've let them down at the critical hour too many times. But I want you to know something about God. No matter how many times you let God down, God is still there. And he's there to welcome you back into his arms and in his life. And if you have any doubt that that's the love that God has for you, you need to look at Calvary. That sacrifice ought to let you know that if God will not spare his only son, that God will. I said God will. I don't know who I'm talking to, but let me say it one more time to the Holy Ghost. God will. Yes, he will. God will give you mercy. The old folks say, God, I need mercy because it's mercy that suits my case. Is there anybody in here who understands that what we need more than anything else is we need mercy? But the good news is good news because it's the news about a God who has extravagant mercy and grace to bestow on all of us who come simply admitting that, Lord, I don't come with anything except a desire for your mercy. It is then that we can connect. It is then that the relationship is enriched. It is then that we can be set free. It is then that God can fix it because we faced it. <laughs> Everybody stand on your feet. We hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a Christian, a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter three, verses 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If you want to be saved and have new life in Jesus Christ, pray this prayer, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours, amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you wanna become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now, and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you. Praise God, I'm, I trust that the word uh, blessed your spirit and blessed those perhaps you were even watching this word with. Listen, do me a favor, uh, whenever you come on on Wednesday, let somebody else know that the word is being preached and that they too can be blessed. Listen, we're able to do this as a consequence of people's faithful giving to Bates Memorial Baptist Church, whether it's members or friends of Bates Memorial, they are really invested in this ministry. We thank God for them. We wouldn't be able to do this without them. You too can participate as well. Uh, there's gonna be several ways that you can give. We try to make it as easy as possible. One way you can give is you can give by your cash app, dollar sign, base memorial, and it'll get right to our account. Or you can text to give. You can be sitting right there with your iPhone and text the information that's on the screen. And it'll get right to our account. Or you can go to our website, basememorial.com. Click on the giving tab, follow the quick brief instructions, and we'll get the uh, gift that you want to give as well. Also, 
If you just want to stop by, you're out and about doing what you're doing and you want to stop by and drop off your gift, you can do that as well. There'll be somebody here to take it and make sure it gets where it's supposed to get. If none of those things work, one good way is just mail it in. You can do that by just sending it to Bates Memorial. That's 620 620 East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203. And we'll make sure it gets where it's supposed to go. What's up, Bates Memorial family and friends? Listen, this is the year that we're serving with a made up mind, and we've got a lot that you can get involved in. Check this out. Hey, Bates Memorial, we are starting our debt free program known as D Free. Join us via Zoom on February the 28th as we say yes to no debt. You can get more information by calling the church. Hey everyone, my name is Erin Ray and I am co-chair for the health ministry at Bates Memorial Baptist Church. 2020 has definitely taught us that health is vitally important. So I'm very excited to share a few events that you should definitely participate in. On February 20th, there's another opportunity for free and confidential HIV testing. This one will take place in the parking lot of Bates Memorial Baptist Church, which is located at 620 Lambton Street. At the same time, there will also be instant COVID testing available. This event is about HIV and AIDS, you can help us eradicate this disease, but it starts with you knowing your status. So please, please take advantage of all these events and help us help you. We're in this together. Stay safe, stay healthy. We love you and we'll see you soon. Hello, Bates family and friends. This is Minister Tony Phelps, staff accountant here at Bates Memorial. The main reason I'm here is to remind you that this will soon be time for us to distribute 2020 giving statements. Given the current pandemic and the need for us to continue to socially distance, we wanna make sure that we have all the information we need to get your giving statements to you. Email is the most efficient way to deliver them to you. But if you prefer delivery by US mail, we can do that too. That means we need to make sure that we have your most current contact information in our system. So we are asking that you go to our website at www.batesmemorial.com, click on the membership tab, enter your email and password, and it will take you directly to your personal page. Or you can create your personal account if you have been signing in as a guest to give or you've been using Cash App. Then you go to the home and select profile and the drop down menu. And from there, you can update your address and telephone number, and you can enter your preferred email address where we will send your 2020 giving statements. Now, if you need a little assistance, don't hesitate to call at 502-636-0523, extension 206, and we will be more than happy to walk you through the process. That's what's going on here at Bates Memorial, and we want you to get involved. I cannot tell you how overjoyed we are to be able to bring you the Word of God and bless you in the middle of the week. Listen, we like to end with prayer and a benediction, so let's go to God in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day that we've never seen before. When it has passed, we'll never see it again. But we thank you for the word that you've given us to help us get through the day and through the week and something to share with somebody else to bless them as well. God, you've been so good to, add, to us. For that, we want to give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, the Lord. Lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace and give thee peace to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time.